our Lord Jesus Christ. We receive you right now. The food, the only food that matters, the water we drink, the air we breathe. And as we recall again, all you are to us, we're so grateful. And we're filled with such satisfaction, such contentment. We're so thankful for you. You've given everything for us. And to think that you would be with us today, this morning, as we worship and as we pray, that your spirit would come close, that you'd be present right now. It's, a, it's an overwhelming thought. You are, are with us. Your dream has been to be reunited with us. And ultimately in your home, it is said that your dwelling place will be with men. We will be your people and you will be our God. And where we live, there'll be no need for the sun because the Lord God himself is the light of it. You are the light of our lives right now and we, we celebrate that. We say with, with David that our soul is our feasted as with a rich feast. Our mouth praises you with joyful lips as we meditate on our beds and think on you in the watches of the night. Lord, right now we want to simply enjoy you and your abundance. We want to sense that completeness that you give us, that fullness that you give us inside. We pray right now for any who have come to worship today who feel empty, who are dominated by fear or anxiety, who struggle with despair about life. Our prayer this morning is that you and your abundance will reach down deep into their hearts, that they will know your fullness in their lives. They will sense what it is to be complete, to be whole in you. This is the healing we ask for today. This is that experience that you offer us, we believe. And by faith, we receive you right now into the very heart of our lives, our, our work, our recreation, our relationships, our homes. We want you right there in the middle of it, knowing that living with you is like a great feast. It's like never being hungry again. You've promised this, that the water that you give us to drink will become like a well of water springing up to eternal life. That you will become like a fountain gushing from within us. This is fullness. This is a rich life. This is contentment as we find it in you, our Lord and Savior. And so we accept this again today and pray this blessing to be realized right now in this moment. Amen. That it'll not be seen as something held before us in the future, but it is a great gift of God to us right now. That sense of fullness and completeness in you. And we receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, we're, we're, as I mentioned, we're just about to come into the holiday season. Uh, it's known as the season of joy, right? The season of giving. It's also the season of discontent. Uh, you, you see all the things you can't have and your discontent level rises proportionately. If you were to believe what the commercials tell you, what you see on TV, what you hear on the radio, uh, then uh, you, you would think that contentment was something you can buy, something you can eat, something you could spray on, something you could drive, something you could uh, you know, uh, get to know on the internet and, you know, have a relationship with or whatever. As if all those things could give you lasting contentment, but they don't. Um, so what is the secret of a satisfying life? Being content. That's what we want to talk about today. This isn't new to you folks. It's just a reminder, especially as we come into the holiday season. Paul says this in Philippians 4, uh, verses 11 and 12. I have learned to be satisfied with what I have, 
I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have more than enough. We sang that, didn't we? All of you is more than enough, Lord. Paul says, I've learned what it is to have more than enough. I've learned this secret so that anywhere, at any time, I am what? Content. That I am content. So what is contentment? Well, it's not apathy or laziness or complacency. Contentment is independent from the circumstances. You don't, you, you don't base your happiness on the situation around you in order to be content. Happiness comes from within. How do you get that kind of contentment, that kind of satisfaction in life? You can ask Diana. I shared with most of you, but some of you may not have looked at our driver's, uh, that our, our license plate on our car. It says S A Y C. 8 TD. People say, what does that mean? Satiated. And I'm so thankful she put that on after we got married. That was wonderful. How, how, do you, how do you get to the point where deep inside you're satisfied, you're content? Paul says contentment is learned. It's not something that's instant. It's not a one-time experience. Life is a school of learning about contentment. And the problem is most people never learn, and they die unfulfilled and unsatisfied and unhappy. So how do you learn contentment? What is contentment? Well, we already said it's something that's independent of our circumstances. It's something that comes from within. Something that comes from within. So we're going to talk about four lessons we all need to learn. You may find yourself at a different place in some of these than another, but I think they're all very important. Number one, Uh, To experience real contentment, you need to learn to avoid comparisons. Avoid comparisons. Comparing yourself to others will always lead to discontent. Paul says in Philippians 4.11, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So if you want to learn to be content, you have to avoid these comparisons. There's always going to be people who make more money than you do. Always. Always. There's going to be people who have greater opportunities than you have, fewer problems than you have. So what? So what? That has no bearing on your own personal happiness. Paul goes on. He says this, 2 Corinthians 4.18. We do not look at what we can see right now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys in heaven. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Paul says, I I don't look around to find happiness. I look up. I look up to God. I look up to what God has promised. I look up to what God has has in store for us. There's some uh, common misconceptions about happiness. Again, we're all very well versed in these. First of all, uh, the first misconception is I have to have what others have in order to be happy. I must have what others have. I look to see what everyone else is wearing, the phone they're using. You know, it's, kinda, it's, kinda, it's hard. It's really hard because when you, when you dress a certain way and, you know, life goes on and everything's fine, but people don't really notice and your wife gets on your case a little bit from time to time, it's, it, it can be tough. But then when you, you accidentally buy a certain kind of pair of jeans and you wear them and you start getting compliments from your wife and your daughter-in-law, and, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, oh, okay, so what is everybody else wearing? <laughs> All of a sudden, we're right there. It's like, i got to have what they have in order to, to make myself feel better. Uh, you, you look at the kind of phone somebody else has. Have you, have you done that? You know, you have one of those old-time flip phones? Where you you know you texting is like it's like learning a foreign language. I never could figure that out. I've no, I've known people who can text on those old style phones faster than I can talk. But you look at you know the new the new HTCs or the new Droids or the new all right Apples whatever. Got to have one of those or or you look around and you see people living in nice neighborhoods and and you and you think. That's what I need to be happy. See, that's how the, the ad agencies and the salespeople keep, you know, their income up is they make you think that you're not happy. And if you just get this one thing, you will be. 
The second misconception is this. I have to be, I must be liked by everyone. Anybody ever struggle with that? You don't have to raise your hand. I I need people to like me. Uh, I've had this bad at times. It's kind of a curse in my life, sometimes stronger than others. Way back in the days when I worked in this little hippie vegetarian restaurant down in San Diego, there was a guy there. He was kind of one of the, the people in charge. He did not like me. The only reason I was there is because the other guy in charge who had more authority than him did like me, but, but this other guy, he didn't like me. And, and I tried so hard to get him to like me, it just didn't work. I couldn't do the things that he did. I couldn't go the places he went. I was devastated. Years later, when I was a pastor in Tennessee, there was a doctor who was like, uh, <laughs> he's like the emperor of his church. Played the organ, so when, when people sang, you couldn't hear the people sing, all you could hear is the organ. But he was, you know, the, the head of the hospital and everything. And, uh, and he didn't like some of the things that I did in my little church just down the river. See, I had a little church about five miles away from the big church, which before I got there, they had separated out and decided they, they knew how to run things better than the big church did. It was sort of like a rebellious church plant kind of thing. And then I came and inherited that. But he didn't like some of the things that we were doing, and he didn't like me. And he agitated to get me moved, actually. I lost sleep over that. You, you can't go through life without, some, uh, without having some kind of disapproval. What, whatever you do, there's always going to be somebody who won't like it or who won't like you. You know Jesus? You know, you know who Jesus is, right? He, he's, like, he's like the gentle shepherd, the kindest Lord and Savior. He's, he's wonderful, full of love, full of mercy, full of grace, tender, kind, all of those things. The truth is Jesus couldn't please everybody. So only a fool would try to do what Jesus even couldn't do, right? That's a second misconception. The third misconception is this, having, having more stuff, having more stuff will make me happier. It's not just like finding other stuff. It's like having more of what I have. You know, like money. Having more money will make me happier. And we we know that it, it doesn't, but it still trips us, you know. How much money would it take to make you happy? You ever asked yourself that? Because you think, I I need more. Well, how much more? You know. And before you let your imagination run away with you with uh, lottery dreams and all that, that'll never happen, you, you know, maybe bring yourself back down to reality. If I just had another $1,000, if I just had another 10000 you know, wherever, wherever the level would be for you. Somebody asked Howard Hughes once, you know who Howard Hughes was, right? One of the richest men in the world at the time. He was asked, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And he said, just a little more. Just a little more. The more you make, the more you have, the more you, then the more that, that you spend, then the more you want. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. It's a good verse to memorize, isn't it? All of your material possessions are temporary. You're in charge of them down here, and you, you get to use them, and you get to manage them, but you don't own anything. Did you ever stop to think about that? You know, I've heard of people who are buried in their Cadillacs. I was thinking about my guitar. You know, my, my guitar that God miraculously brought back to me a few months earlier when it got stolen here at the church. Had the guitar for 40-some years. I was thinking when I was preparing for this, what about my guitar? Do I really want to let somebody else have that when I'm gone? Maybe I should be buried with it. So when the resurrection comes, God will take me and the guitar to heaven. Problem is that if that happens, the thing will be eaten. It'll be eaten before I'm eaten by the worms and the moths and all that stuff. we, We don't own anything. We don't own anything. And the things that we do have, they're not going to last. They're just not going to last. So don't get an obsession with your possessions. 
the real cause of our desire and pursuit of material things is that we compare ourselves with others, our friends, our neighbors, TV personalities, rivals, respected co-workers, whoever. We see what they have. We see the crews they're taking. We see the cool gadgets they're carrying. And we want what we don't have. And so we're discontent. We're discontent. So, so one of the root problems in not being contented is comparing myself with others. The second lesson we need to learn is this. We need to learn to adjust to change. We need to learn to adjust to change. Uh, life is full of ups and downs. We all have emotional ups and downs, right? Physical ups and downs. Anybody here feeling better than you've ever felt in your life today? You thought I was going to ask you if anybody was feeling sick, right? <laughs> See, if I ask who's sick, and you raise your hand, everybody's going to clear out around you. They won't sit. <laughs> but, you know, if, I, if, if you could say, I'm feeling better today than I've ever felt in my life, but then you can think of a time when you weren't feeling so well. You know, we have those ups and we have those downs. Our, our mental uh, 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 situation, our financial situation, it's full of ups. Life is full of ups and downs. The only thing that you and I can be sure of in life is that things will change. Well, they say death and taxes. You know, death only happens once. Taxes, well, that happens every year. But then the government, sometimes they, they delay it. You know, they, they change. The only thing you can really depend upon as you are living is that things are going to change for you and for the world around you. How well do you handle change? When things change in your life, when relationships change, when circumstances change, how well do you, do you handle it? Do you, do you get frightened? Do you get afraid? Or, or do you get moody? I get moody sometimes. I say, what's wrong with you? I do the Benson growl, you know. The other day she asked me, what do you, I was making noises, what are you doing? I said, I'm just making man noises, it's okay. But, but, you know, sometimes I get moody. Or do you get angry at change because you don't know how to deal with it? Or you, you, get, you get uptight? Paul says that one of the secrets to, of learning to be content in life is the ability to adjust to all kinds of circumstances and change. So learn to adjust to it. Learn to flow with it. Learn to loosen up. Your happiness in life is going to depend on your ability to adapt and be, be flexible because change is going to happen whether you like it or not. It's just going to happen. There's been times when I've, I've been in a group of people. I can think back in my college years, and we were, we were with a group of people. It was, just, it was like we, we were in heaven. We all loved the Lord. We were sharing Christ with other people. We were celebrating. We were worshiping every day. I mean, it, it just felt like nothing. We were, we were invincible in a, in a way. And then everything changed. We, we grew up and got married and had kids and got divorced and made fortunes and lost fortunes and things, life happened. We, everything changed. I know, Paul says in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. The Berkeley translation puts it this way, I've learned to be independent of circumstances. You, you don't get your joys or your happiness out of things. Well, you shouldn't. <laughs> or people, or possessions, or pleasures, or profits, or popularity, or prestige. Paul says he's learned to be independent of his circumstances. Now, when Paul wrote this, when Paul wrote, wrote this, he was old which meant in those days, you know, there wasn't any central heat and air in the prison that he was sitting in. Oh, he was in prison, and he was old. It was cold. It was damp. He didn't have freedom of any kind. He, he didn't have friends to come see them, and yet he, he could say, I can handle this. I can cope. I can avoid comparing myself to others, and I can adjust to change. I am flexible. We have to be flexible because circumstances just aren't. They just aren't. Paul says, no matter what I go through, I am not a victim. No matter 
what I go through, I am not a victim. No matter what people do to me, they are not going to control my life. You know, Paul was killed for his faith. No matter what they do to me, I'm not, they're not going to control my life, that, that inner life that God wants to have with each one of us. No matter what hurt or experience or difficulty I, I go through, I have every reason to have, and, and I have every reason to have bad memories. I will not let it victimize me. I don't know if any of you saw the interview with uh, Elizabeth Smart recently, the young lady who was abducted and, and put through uh, maybe a year and a half of just the most horrible situation you can imagine. And, and as the interviewer talked to her, she just... She just had this peace. You know, it's just amazing. She had come to terms with it. No matter what this individual or what these individuals had done to her, she decided she was not going to live her life as a victim, but she was going to live her life as a victor. She was going to hold on to what she had inside of her. No one could take that away. I'm independent of circumstances. You are not your circumstances. Real freedom is when you can say, I'm not controlled by what's happening around me, by the external things in my life. Sometimes you ask somebody, how are you doing? They say, well, under the circumstances, I'm okay. (laughs) But you you ever stop to think, you shouldn't be under the circumstances, you should be on top of them, right? I know it's semantics, but... Why be under the circumstances? There's three kinds of circumstances in our lives. First of all, circumstances I can control, and I do control. If you don't like the channel you're watching on TV, grab the remote and change it, unless your wife happens to be holding it at the time. Then do not do that. I'm amazed at at how people get so upset when they're watching things on on TV, and, and, and a commercial comes on, or there's something in a program they don't like, they think it's offensive, or it's, it's politically incorrect, or it's racist, or it's, it's, it's gross, or whatever. And so they start a campaign to legislate change. You can't do this, you can't say that. These words aren't acceptable on TV. And, and, and it's like they're victims of what's coming on the screen. Guess what? Use the clicker, turn the TV off. If you don't like what's on it, just turn it off. It's not worth much anyway, what's coming across. Change the channel. If you're eating too many cheeseburgers and shakes, and you're getting diabetes, just stop going to the fast food place that serves them. Change what you put in your mouth. You have control, and we can take control of things. There are circumstances I can control, but I don't. (laughs) See, contentment is not just letting things happen around me. It's not complacency. It's not laziness. If, If you can change something, and you need to take action, do something about it. So many times... I've been complaining. I have a problem with that occasionally. Driving home or at home, and I'm just, I'm I'm complaining and I'm just just frolicking, if you could use that word. I'm frolicking in my misery, you know. And Diana, you know, she'll she'll take it for a while, and then she'll say, well, what have you done about it? (laughs) Have you talked to this person? Have you taken these steps? And they're like, oh. No. <laughs> End of complaining session. Man, you know how to take my miserable joy away, don't you? <laughs> Takes all the fun out of being discontent. And then there are circumstances that I cannot control. Things that happen, I have no control over whatsoever. There are so many of those in our lives. That's where we need contentment. When we experience things that are beyond our power, you do everything you can but it's just an uncontrollable situation. In situations like that, all you can do is relax, trust God, and adjust. Sometimes we have to adjust not only to circumstances, but to people, especially when the people don't change. And Paul, Paul says in, in Romans 12, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So you take all the steps you can to have good relationships, to have congenial relationships, but sometimes other people, they just don't want to play ball. They just don't want to go along with it. So you can only do what you can do. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. One of the keys to adjusting 
with circumstances is to have a sense of humor, like I had to have last week. Preaching, and I was on page one, and then I came to page three. I told Steve, just don't even put that video on YouTube for this week. And, uh, and it got worse. I started talking about, well, I won't even say, because <laughs> then we'll do it again. So you have to laugh at yourself, you know? I could get so embarrassed about it, I could go through three weeks of shame, and then I'd really be in a mess, but I can't afford to do that. You just have to laugh. When I was pastoring the church that I mentioned earlier in Tennessee, we lived in a log cabin on top of a hill. We had a horse. There was lots of room. We had three acres on top of the hill. Our next door neighbor had 40. Back of us was 20. And then the doctor on, on the other section, he had 20 or 30 acres. And his house, went, his house sat down on the back side of the hill. He had to go up a long driveway over the hill and down to his house. He had a large, beautiful home, beautiful gardens and yards. So uh, the problem is I had a ho- we had a horse. My daughter had a horse. We, we, thought, we thought getting a horse was like getting a dog. Uh, don't ever fall for that one. So the problem was we didn't have good fencing. It was like one strand of electrical wire you know, on post. And this horse, uh, her name was Lucky, and she believed it because she could get out of anything if she wanted to. So one Sabbath, about 15 minutes before the service began, a call came into the church. Your horse is in my garden. It was the doctor whose property was next to ours, and he took pride in his garden. It was about November, and so he was growing some really nice cabbages, ornamental cabbages, you know. And so uh, Lucky, evidently, Lucky the horse, evidently uh, got tired of eating hay and wanted to munch some of the cabbage. Beside, uh, and so, so uh, she made a break for it. She could, you know, they can smell stuff a long ways away. She made a break for it, and she went down alongside. She didn't go on the pavement, because they had a paved driveway. She went alongside of it. Been rain, so the grass is soft. So his nice green lawn alongside the road was, was full of hoof marks, you know, turf all over the place. And uh, went down to the garden. So that meant that I had to leave church, go home, and run down the backside of the hill, catch the horse, take her back up to our sad little pasture and try to make sure that she didn't get out and then get back to preach I had some mud on my shoes and mud on my pants it was frustrating and maddening and it made me want to say some not nice words I might have slipped up with the horse I don't remember but I was embarrassed and I was late for the service I think I got back to church just about the time the second hymn was being sung I could have seen myself as a a complete victim of my daughter's horse and told my daughter, you got to get rid of that thing. It was tempting to blame her, blame the horse, blame the doctor for caring about his stupid cabbage. But really, it's hilarious. It's funny. Here's the preacher ready to deliver great gems of wisdom to the congregation. He has to go run around in the mud and cold after a horse that just wants a snack. Sometimes all you can do is just laugh. If you don't, they say, you'll cry, right? (laughs) Circumstances that I can't control require flexibility. And one of the best ways to be flexible is just laugh. Find some humor in the situation. Third, we need to learn, in order to be content, we need to learn to draw on Christ's power. How many times have you or I come into a challenging situation, one that threatens our contentment, and we just plunge ahead on our own? We just go, go ahead. We don't really think about God. We just do it. And then after the fact, we go and ask God to help us get out of the mess. Here's another secret Paul reveals. I can do everything, he says in Philippians 4, 4.13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You can handle it when your kids are giving you grief. You can make it through when the stock market is, is on a downswing and you've got a lot invested, you're worried about your retirement. When you have problems and you don't know where to go, Paul says you can cope, you can handle everything if you have a source of power outside of yourself. Paul depended on God's power, not his own. You know how you know when you're depending on your own power? You get really, really tired. You're working so hard in your mind and your emotions to manage everything, and it just, 
You just can't do it. And, it. and it wears you out. It's a fatigue that goes beyond just normal, tired at the end of the day kind of thing. Depending on, God, on your strength instead of God's, you, you can't do it all. You can't manage it all. You can't take care of everyone's feelings or fix every mess or solve every pro- problem when it's, when it's your doing or, or someone else's doing. Only the power of God can help you truly cope. Y'all know the serenity prayer, right? We have celebrate recovery here. I know at least some of you know it. And, and, and how does it go? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I what? Cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. But the key is that very first phrase, God grant me. It isn't just, I got to figure out how to be okay with the stuff I can't change, or I've got to just, I've gotta just uh, uh, take, be proactive and change all the stuff I can change. It's, it starts out, God grant me, God grant me the courage to change the things I can. The serenity, give me the serenity to accept the things I can't change. Jerusalem Bible puts it this way, there is nothing I cannot master with the help of the one who gives me strength. So today, what do you need to control? What is it that you need, you know, some control over in your life? You need to get control of your time, your mouth. (laughs) I, I need that from time to time, particularly when I'm driving. Oh, and I have to really watch it. When I took Bucky and, and Yalda and Gabriel, in the in, last week to see Keith, we're on the freeways and, and there was traffic jams. And I, I don't, you know, if I said anything bad, forgive me and God forgive me. I don't think I did, but I could have, you know. Do you need to, do you need to control your temper? Or, or do you need to control your weight? Need to control, get, get control over a bad habit that's really wreaking havoc in your life? Paul says, I can master anything with the help of Christ who gives me strength. Try quoting the verses like we said last week. You know, we know these things, but do you actually put it into your mind and and, and quote it and claim it? Claim this promise. It really works. God's going to help you. If you say, Lord, you promised you would give me strength for the things that I need control over. The Amplified Version puts it this way, kind of breaks it out. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. You have a big problem you're facing today? Something you don't know how to solve? Paul says you can be ready for anything. You can be confident. See, satisfaction not only comes from From contentment, it comes from confidence. And you and I can be completely confident in Christ's power. The Greek word for strength is is a word which we get the word uh, we get the word dynamo from. Dynamo. You know what a dynamo is? Isn't it something that continues to give energy? It gives continual energy. Paul says, Jesus Christ is the dynamo of my life. He gives me continuous energy. I can do anything. I can do all things. It doesn't mean he's invincible. It means he draws on the strength of Jesus Christ. So whatever he's facing, he knows he has a reserve of power at all times. I don't run out. I'm confident. I'm capable to cope with the circumstances of life because I draw on Christ's power. See, Paul had a problem. Paul had a problem. He... He calls it his thorn in the flesh. Bible scholars have debated what it was. Some people said it was his, his eyes, his eyesight, that he was nearly blind. Some people say, I, I've actually heard this, some people say it's his wife because he converted and she didn't, and so she was a thorn in his flesh. I don't believe that one, but anyway. He, he had a weakness, and he asked God, he tells us, he asked God three times, to remove this particular weakness in his life. God didn't remove it. 
This is what Paul says about it. But God said to me, God said to me, this is really another great verse to memorize. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. The word sufficient here is the same word that's used in Philippians when it says content or contentment. Sufficiency is contentment. Contentment is independent of circumstances. God allows us to go through problems in our life so we can learn how to be content, how to be full of God, how to, how to have sufficiency in our life, how to be satiated. <laughs> so that God can show his power. You know, if we, if we, had, if we had complete control over everything, if we could like manage well and we, we always always kept our words the right way and we said the right things and did the right things, if we did everything perfectly and we were always on top of it and and we didn't feel bad, you know, we didn't have one of those down physical days or down emotional days, if we were just always on top of it, where would God's power be shown in our lives? The greatest power of God I've ever seen has been through people who are beaten down and it looks like they're about to go out. People who just hold on tenaciously to the power of Christ, no matter what. We have some of those people sitting right here in this congregation. God God reveals his greatness, his power, through our weakness. And And if you've done everything you can do in your power, and you just accept and adjust, don't worry about what other people are thinking or doing, God says, look, I'm, gonna, I'm with you. I'm going to sustain you. Hold on. The last lesson we need to learn is this. To trust God to meet my needs. To trust God to meet my needs. My God will use his glorious riches to give you everything you need. He will do this through Christ Jesus. Last week we talked about the promises of God, and, and, and we use this very verse This very verse, if if there's one promise more than any other that expresses the secret to contentment, it's this verse right here. It, it It doesn't say God will just meet your spiritual needs, the things that have to do with your spiritual life or your religious life. It doesn't it doesn't say that he'll just meet a few of your needs according to how he feels at the at a given time. God's not capricious with us. It says My God will use his glorious riches to give you everything you need. He'll meet all of your needs. All of your needs. See, worry, we worry about all kinds of things, but worry is the opposite of contentment. This verse gives us freedom from worry. If you accept it, if you believe it, if you claim it, you don't have to worry because God's going to take care of everything you need. God's going to take care of everything you need. Yes, It's true. We have to learn also how to distinguish what we really need and what we really want. You know, we want stuff, but do we always need what we want? And we have to go through life to figure some of that out. But why not do this? Why not just take everything, what you think you need, what you know you want, and put it all before God? Just put it all before Him. He's going to help you sort it out, believe me. See, Psalm says uh, uh, that, that God will, will give us the desires of our heart if we put our trust in him. There's some stuff that you want that God wants for you. Did you ever think about talking to him about it? About asking him for it? Just put it before him. Tell him what you really want, and he'll show you what you really need. And the Bible says he will provide for it. Another verse we use quite a bit is, is this one from Matthew 6, 31. Through 33. So do not start worrying. Where will my food come from, or my drink, or my clothes? Your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Instead, be concerned about everything else with God's kingdom, and He will provide you with all these other things. Put God first, and God will take care of what you need. You put Him at the center, and everything else will be taken care of. The reason people are unhappy and unfulfilled and discontent is because Jesus Christ is not the center of their lives. I can say that's true in my life. Whenever, I, whenever Christ is like on the periphery, 
Whenever he becomes one of the 28, you know, <laughs> whenever he's not in the center, I, I lose my way. When Jesus Christ is the center of my life, I don't, I don't crave, I don't feel discontent. People look for fulfillment in all the wrong places. They look for something that's going to satisfy. Maybe in a relationship or in a job or a hobby or a sport, some kind of exciting activity or recreation. People go from fad to fad, read countless self-help books and go to seminars looking for the secret to being content. But God has laid it all out very clearly. You and I were made with a God-shaped vacuum in our lives. That's been a thought that's been around for quite a few years. There's a hole inside of our spiritual heart. And only God can fill that void. Only God. When you try to find satisfaction through all the other stuff, you find out it just doesn't last. It just doesn't last. Discontent just means that Jesus Christ is not the center. When I'm contented, it means I'm looking for something else. God wants each one of us to have a happy and fulfilling and satisfying life. Jesus said this, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it how much? Abundantly. As much as you can possibly get of it. Life in the fullest is is what God wants us to have. But the way that you and I learn satisfaction is by learning how to be content. So which of these four lessons do you need work on today? Do you need to learn or relearn? Have you figured out that it's really not a good idea to compare yourself with other people? Do you find yourself doing that? You know, you don't even think about it, but all of a sudden you realize what you're going after is because of that comparison business. The Bible warns in 2 Corinthians about comparing ourselves to other people, what other people have, what they do or think. None of that's going to make you happy. You you think that getting a new car will make you happy? Maybe it's a new Lincoln. You know, they have a really cool Lincoln add-on nowadays. Or or a BMW, or like us, uh, a new Honda van with all the bells and whistles. But guess what? It won't. It won't make you happy. It'll feel good for a while. It'll smell new for a little while but then you'll just start getting mad while you're in traffic again and the car won't be new anymore because you've been driving it. It's not new. Do you need to learn to adjust in your situation, in your circumstances? What is the situation that's left you unsatisfied? Is it a marriage? Is it the fact that you're single? Your possessions or the lack of possessions, your job, your health. What are your circumstances that that leave you wanting? Paul says, I've learned to be content in every situation. If you can change it, change it. But if there's something you really can't change, then be content. See, contentment's not just fooling yourself. It's not playing mind games and pretending like you like what you really don't like. Paul didn't like being in prison. He didn't like being cold. He didn't like being hungry. He didn't like being beaten. He didn't like being under the threat of death all the time. But he was content in Christ. He learned to live above his circumstances. And with Christ's power, each one of us can learn to cope. Maybe you don't like what you're going through today, but you don't have to allow it to destroy you or to define you. You and I can learn to be happy in spite of our problems. And only by depending on the power of Christ can we do that. Do you need to learn that God's got it all under control? Do you need to learn that that he really will provide everything you need in your life? you need to learn that? That's the fourth part of this secret to being content, believing that Christ is all-sufficient. When I stop comparing, learn to stop comparing, learn to adjust to life's realities, to live under Christ's power instead of my own, and when I learn to trust that he cares completely for me and will provide for everything, I mean everything that we really need, then I'll have learned how to be content. Lord, 
You know the needs of our lives. You know that in this room we have a lot of struggles, a lot of problems to face, a lot of questions about how to solve things that we just don't understand. And it, it means there's a lot of potential for discontent in our lives too, God. Help us to learn how to be content in you, with you, no matter what our circumstances. No matter what we see other people doing, no matter what we, what we feel from other people, whether they like us, whether they don't, whether they accept us or not, we just ask God that you would help us to trust in your power, to, to trust in, in your love and your caring, that you love us enough that you'll do exactly what you said. You would provide for everything that we need. Teach us, God, through the circumstances, through the relationships of our lives, even through our weaknesses, teach us how to be satisfied in you no matter what.